Managing your law practice can be challenging. Marketing, time management, attracting clients, and all the things besides the cases that you need to do that aren't billable. Welcome to this edition of the Unbillable Hour, the Law Practice Advisory Podcast. This is where you'll get the information you need from expert guests and host Christopher Anderson, here on Legal Talk Network. Welcome to the Unbillable Hour, the Law Practice Advisory Podcast, helping attorneys achieve more success. We're glad you can listen today on Legal Talk Network. And today's episode is about, well, it's about production in a way, but it's also about marketing and sales. And in truth, it's actually about the future of law firms. And I'm really, really excited about the show and our guest today. The title of the show is Into the Future with a Client-Centered Law Firm, and my guest is Jack Newton. If anybody doesn't know, Jack is the CEO and co-founder of Clio, and Jack began his career with a snow shoveling business um, and then uh, made his way onto a strategic vision in founding Clio as the leader in legal cloud computing. Um, I read a note on his bio that despite uh, his hectic schedule, he's made time to run every day for the last 20 years, which makes me really, really uh, unimpressed with myself, (laughs) uh, who uh, I started running about three years ago and managed about three or four days a week, and I thought I was really doing great. So uh, it looks like I have something to step up to. And of course, I am your host. I'm Christopher Anderson. I'm an attorney with a singular passion for helping other lawyers achieve success with their law firm businesses. And in the unbillable hour each month, we explore an area important to help you be a more profitable lawyer through growing your revenues and getting back more of your time and getting more professional satisfaction from your business. The unbillable hour is dedicated to bringing you guests each month to help you learn more about how to make your law firm business work for you instead of the other way around. And before we get started, I do want to say a thank you to our sponsors, Nexa, Solo Practice University, Scorpion, and Law Clerk. Nexa, formerly known as Answer One, is a leading virtual receptionist and answering service provider for law firms. Learn more by giving them a call at 800-267-9371 or online at www.nexa.com. Solo Practice University is a great resource for solos no matter how long you've been practicing. Make sure you check out solopracticeuniversity.com and learn how to run your practice better. Scorpion crushes the standard for law firm online marketing with proven campaign strategies to get attorneys better cases from the internet. Partner with Scorpion to get an award-winning website and ROI positive marketing programs today. Visit scorpionlegal.com forward slash podcast. Law Clerk, where attorneys go to hire freelance lawyers. Visit lawclerk.legal to learn how to increase your productivity and your profits by working with talented freelance lawyers. And again, today's episode of the Unbillable Hour is Into the Future with a client-centered law firm. And my guest is Jack Newton, CEO and co-founder of Clio. Jack, welcome to the Unbillable Hour. Thanks for having me, Christopher. It's really my pleasure. Now, it's uh, become a tradition on the the Unbillable Hour that my introductions are really crappy. Uh, So I I just like to give my guests the opportunity to do a better job. Uh, So uh, please uh, let us know a little bit more about uh, your background and what led you to this topic of uh, the client-centered law firm. Sure. So, uh, you know, my, my background, you know, in legal started 12 years ago when I, when I founded Clio and, uh, my background's as a technologist, my, my training is in, uh, computer science and what I saw back in 2008, uh, along with my co-founder Ryan Govro was, uh, an enormous opportunity to bring at that point the, the nascent power of cloud computing, to bear on on legal, which at the time we saw as one of the last, if not the last major industry to be fundamentally transformed by technology. When we looked at how lawyers were practicing and the ways that they were, in some cases, struggling without any technology at all, or in some cases, struggling with uh, the hard to use, cumbersome on-premise technologies of that era, uh, we saw an enormous uh, disruptive opportunity to bring the power of the cloud, the power of cloud computing to bear uh, on the legal space and launched back in 2008, the very first cloud-based practice management system, which of course was uh, was Clio. 
we saw, I, I think, immediate and uh, enormous success that uh, has only compounded over the last uh, 11 plus years that we've been on the market to the point that uh, Clio is now the most widely used practice management system on the planet, uh, used by uh, over 150,000 legal professionals on a, on a daily basis. Uh, and Clio itself has become quite an enterprise. We've got all, over 500 employees uh, in five offices oh, yeah. uh, worldwide today. So that's a little bit of the the Clio founding story. And, sure. and uh, your question around the client-centered law firm, for me, this has always been uh, a passion of mine. And one of the uh, really interesting journeys for me over the last decade plus of building Clio has been evolving the conversation about the cloud from being simply a productivity enhancer to something that allows lawyers to truly deliver legal services in a way that they weren't able to in the uh, in the past. And I think that's one of the biggest mm-hmm. opportunities that technology and one of the underappreciated aspects of what technology has to offer to lawyers is, is for them to truly transform the way they're delivering their legal services to their clients and to really raise their game and step up their game in terms of the ways they're interacting with their clients, the way they're delivering work product to their clients, even things as mundane as the way they're, uh, they're invoicing their clients and collecting payments from their clients. These are all areas that technology can allow lawyers to innovate in a really substantial way and to drive really significant uh, competitive advantages for themselves. And all of that ties around taking a completely new perspective on how you're designing and delivering your legal services through the lens of a client-centric law firm. That is certainly a huge uh, undertaking. And, and I think, uh, you know, I think, as you said, you've been thinking about this for a long time. But so, so I, I think I hope we didn't bury the lead. But you actually have written a book about this, and that's uh, one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about today. Is what drove you to read this book? Which, by the way, I recommend everybody on this podcast read the book when it comes out. When's that coming out, Jack? The book is coming out on January twenty eighth. January twenty eighth is the date. Everybody should pick up a Thank copy. You. To me, it's, it's funny because the book to me is both optimistic and has embedded in it a warning. Um, and it's, to me, the more, one of the most clarifying visions uh, of the future since Suskin's Tomorrow's Lawyers um, as, as to you know, the path that we're driving towards as well as the pitfalls of uh, failing to adapt. So what, let's, let's just start with the, with the words, right? What do you actually mean by client-centered law firm? So yeah, well, first of all, thank you for the, uh, the high praise of the, the book. I, I really uh, appreciate that. And you know, for, for me, the catalyst for, for writing the book was really seeing the, the patterns I've seen over the last decade of what separates uh, successful, thriving law firms from those that, uh, those that struggle. And in, in my role as, as CEO of Clio and uh, you know, traveling the country, uh, speaking at uh, hundreds of of uh, these uh, solo and small firm conferences and ABA Tech Show and and uh, our own Clio Cloud Conference. I've interacted with with thousands and thousands of of lawyers and and been in a, a privileged position to both see you know best pr- practices uh, put to work um, and and had sure. a unique opportunity to partner with many of these leading edge law firms from a technology perspective at the CLIO level to really help them innovate and rethink how they're delivering their legal services. And, and the, the client-centered law firm as a book is really a synthesis of that, that decade plus of learning and collaborating uh, that I've done, you know, in, in conjunction with the, you know, my, my partners at these, uh, at these law firms in terms of what a new model of legal service delivery might look like. And to your question around the the words, this idea of a client-centric law firm yeah. is really a really straightforward concept, but I hadn't seen you know, a book or, or any other kind of publication really distill in a really clear way what I thought was a, a playbook for what becoming a client-centered law firm looks like. And at the heart of all of this is the idea that if law firms rethink the way they deliver their legal services as being centered around the client and really working backwards from the client and what their needs are and what their state of mind might be um, and and what their direct as well as indirect needs in any, any given moment might be, displaying an enormous amount of empathy for your client and trying to proactively address what your client's needs might be is really at the heart of what being 
uh, a client-centered law firm looks like. And, you know, we, we lay out five key values of a client-centered law firm in the book. Uh, it's around developing deep client empathy, uh, practicing attentiveness, uh, generating ease with communication, uh, demanding effortless experiences and every touch point with your clients, uh, all with a view to creating uh, clients for life. And we think if, if law firms are able to embrace these five core values of a client-centric law firm and really redesign everything from their intake process to the way that they work through a typical case with a client to the way they, they tie off a case with a client, there's an enormous opportunity for firms to, uh, to innovate and to deliver legal services in a way that is better for the lawyer and better for the client and, and better for the law firm in terms of driving what we call the, the flywheel of growth for law firms. Yeah, those are definitely concepts I'm going to follow up with you on. I want to talk about the five cores uh, values and the, and the flywheel concept. So what I'm, what I'm hearing you talking about is about a law firm that's designed around, and obviously in reading, is designed around the client experience. And I think one of the key distinctions I think are important to draw is that between client centered and client first. I mean, in fact, you've got one of your chapters is entitled "Don't put right. your clients first. And I, I, that one just like jumped right out at me because I'm like, we're talking about client centered, but you're like, don't put your clients first. And I think that's a huge pitfall that a lot of law firms uh, fall into. So, can you just talk a little bit about what it means to put your clients first and how that's different from client centered? But can you do that right after this break? Absolutely. Fantastic. So we're talking to Jack Newton about uh, his book, uh, the CEO and uh, co-founder of Clio, about his book, The Client-Centered Law Firm. We've been talking about what it means to be client-centered, and we're going to distinguish what that means from uh, client first. But first, we'll hear a word from our sponsors. So it's sponsors first, and then back to Jack. Law Clerk is where attorneys go to hire freelance lawyers. Whether you need a research memo or a complicated appellate brief, our network of freelance lawyers have every level of experience and expertise. Sign up is free, and there are no monthly fees. Only pay the flat fee price you set. Use rebate code UNBILLABLE to get a $100 Amazon gift card when you complete your next project. Learn more at lawclerk.legal. If you're missing calls, appointments, and potential clients, it's time to work with Nexa Professional. More than just an answering service, Nexa's virtual receptionists are available 24-7 to schedule appointments, qualify leads, respond to emails, integrate with your firm's software, and much more. Nexa ensures your clients have the experience they deserve. Give them a call at 800-267-9371 or visit them at nexa.com forward slash podcast for a special offer. And we're back uh, with the Unbillable Hour talking to Jack Newton, the founder of the co-founder of Clio, a CEO of Clio, and the author of the Client Centered Law Firm. And we were talking about uh, what the difference is between client-centered law firm and putting clients first, and particularly about your chapter in the book, Don't Put Your Clients First. So I thought we definitely should uh, should make this clear about what you meant and what's the distinction between these two. Yeah, so I, I think it's a it's a it's a great question and a great clarifying question because I, I think you know it's one of the points we do as, as you pointed out make strenuously in the book, which is the concept of becoming a client centric law firm does not necessarily mean you're always putting your clients first. And I think the the problem with with saying something as straightforward sounding is always put your clients first is the implied trade off is you're putting something else second. And that might be uh, yourself, it might be putting your law firm second, it might be putting your law firm partners second, your staff, somebody else is suffering if you're saying the, the client always comes first. And that's not the prevailing wisdom that we're trying to convey with uh, the client-centered law firm, which is that in many cases, if you take a client-centered approach to designing your legal services, in many cases, you can actually have a win-win across all of the stakeholders in that interaction with the the client, and you're not you're not sacrificing yourself, you're not sacrificing your staff, or, and you're not sacrificing the client. But you're actually trying to create these win-win scenarios where every party is coming out, out on top because of the way you've designed uh, your law firm and designed the processes around right. uh, around the client. And I think client first also to me connotes 
almost a, a reactive rather than proactive model. Um, and I, I think many lawyers, mm. when they think about you know putting their clients first, it may just be well, be really responsive when the client reaches out to you or always put their needs first. Right. And that's not necessarily what being a client centric law firm is about. It's not being about it's not about being reactive. It's about being proactive and anticipating your client's needs and designing your your entire law firm's processes and systems so that you can be highly responsive to your uh, your clients without uh, disrupting the services you're delivering, not just to that one client, but to the, the dozens or hundreds of others clients you might be servicing as well. Yeah. In fact, I think that the one word that you, you said there is what I want to kind of expand on a little bit. You said designing, because uh, something really just one of the things that jumped out at me was a comment you made in the book that you can't be responsible for your client's experience. They come to your law firm with all the baggage and all the stuff that's going on in their life. And for most lawyers, it's not the best moment in your client's lives. Um, you know, unless you're a business lawyer, sometimes it is, but a lot of times it isn't. Uh, but what you can do is design an experience that they will go through that is designed to make that process as painless as possible without taking responsibility right. for their individual experience. I, I think what a lot of lawyers fail to appreciate is that there's uh, an enormous amount of context and knowledge that they can help bring to bear to a client's experience. And again, that that empathy piece, understanding that you know, as a lawyer, you often have the benefit of having seen whatever your practice area might be. You've seen dozens or hundreds of companies get incorporated. Uh, if you're a family lawyer, maybe you've gone through uh, dozens or hundreds of divorces. You, you've got the pattern recognition yeah. to understand what clients are about to go through and help them anticipate not just the thing they're experiencing this moment, but help them anticipate what's coming down the uh, the pike. Maybe some phone calls that they need to be making that are completely unrelated to the legal engagement they have with you, but helping them understand, here's the two or three things that are going to happen next that I can help you anticipate. And it's that partnership model, I think, of, of viewing, uh, as you pointed out, many lawyers are dealing with clients that are in some form of crisis, whether that's personal or business. And if it's not a form of crisis, it's almost always a high stakes situation. Just by virtue of having a lawyer involved, sure. there's a certain amount of importance that uh, and weight that goes along with that interaction that your, your client is having with you. And if, if lawyers you know, really spend the time to look at their their client as they're coming in through the door with whatever their specific situation might be and try to understand how can I be a partner to this client? How can I bring the uh, experience that I have to, br to bear on this given my collective experience across dozens or hundreds or thousands of cases like this? How can I help my client navigate this next stage of their uh, their personal life or their business life more successfully than they would be able to without me. I think it's it's just a completely new lens for lawyers to uh, to look at their their legal transactions in a less transactional way. And I, I think even my experience <laughs> yeah. with, uh, with with lawyers is that um, they do take a very transactional view on their interactions with clients, but they leave I think a lot of opportunity to build deeper relationships with their clients. Um, and an opportunity to develop more business with their clients if they if they make that investment in really trying to become a partner to their uh, to their clients and helping solve not just the task at hand but the broader challenge that 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 client is going to be facing over the next set of days months or or years. Yeah, and I think that's funny that that you use the word transactional here because I, I want to make sure our listeners distinguish that we're not talking about. Uh, lawyers who do business transactions, you know, transactional versus litigation. We're talking about about a concept that that's really running rampant through all the professions, where we all you know have our particular hammer, um, and we're all looking for nails, and we think our job is to bang the nail rather than build the house, and and we're not having that deeper relationship with the client, not living up to our title of counselor at law. Right, uh, and in that problem, we're not serving the client fully, which also means I think you just set it up, Jack. Is just we're also missing as lawyers huge amount of opportunity to drive value into that relationship, which should result and will result in improved revenues and improved profits for our businesses. 
to this client first versus client centric perspective, this is no. this is also a win win. This isn't a, a trade off where you know the client's losing out or you're losing out. This this is a win win where you're understanding your clients' needs better and better able to service their needs by by taking this client centric uh, approach. And I, I, I think it's. You know, the, the, your point on, on the usage of the word transactional is really important because I do think that this is, you know, an opportunity for lawyers in almost every practice area to look at their engagements with their clients in a, in a less transactional way and in a way where they can be much more proactive in how they're engaging in that, in that conversation. And I'll, I'll just give you a few simple examples from, you know, my, my personal life. You know, I, I had a will done uh, with, my, with my wife around 10 years ago. Yeah, and this was before we had kids. This was before, uh, before Clio. This is before uh, I, I moved to Vancouver. So, you know, major life events uh, for me happened over the last decade. Uh, but that that wills and estates lawyer that I used over over ten years ago uh, to help craft our wills. I haven't heard a word from him in the last the last decade. Whereas, wow. if 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 he reached out to me even on a uh, an annual basis. Even even if this was a simple drip marketing campaign run from uh, an email automation package that that he could use, just pinging me and saying, "Hey, has anything interesting happened in your life in the last year? If so, let's jump on the phone and figure out how that impacts your uh, your will." Just thinking about your clients' needs in a in a in a life cycle and uh, a lawyer staying on top of their the developments in their client's life will just be a better partner to that client, uh, help make sure that they've got, you know, an up-to-date and accurate will. And, you know, in the meantime, you know, they'll do well by their firm and do well by their revenues uh, as a side effect of that. But really, it's 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 just staying close to your client and staying close to understanding what their needs are. Um, I, I think many, uh, you know, whether it's business lawyers or or uh, consumer-facing lawyers have an opportunity to stay in closer touch with their clients, to understand what their needs are, how they're evolving over uh, over time, and they will build uh, a mutual sense of, of of trust and understanding that uh, will only be be good for both parties. Yeah, I think that's a beautiful, that's a fantastic example because yeah, clearly you know you're you're the poster child. For you know, needing to follow up with uh, life circumstances, it might have changed a little bit. You know, may, maybe you built the world's leading case management software for law firms. Maybe you didn't, but you know, uh, right? It's, you know, there's significant business developments. There, I've got you know three instead of zero kids. I I live yeah. in a different uh, city, so there's there's all those all those implications that. Uh, you know, again, you know that uh, I, I think the the approach for many law firms is. You know, done and dusted. Uh, I've I've shipped the will. The work yep. product is yep. done. Great. Let's file this away in a uh, in a folder somewhere, and and it's it's forgotten. The idea that you would you know follow up with your clients and you know even stay in touch with them with some kind of systematized system to to reach out to them every six months or twelve months. You know, a simple phone call. Can I drop by the office and find out what's going on with the the company? I, I think it's those kinds of lightweight interactions that. Uh, can be a very minor investment on the law firm's part with a, uh, a huge amount of leverage, a huge amount of, of upside with that, that very uh, reasonable investment. Yeah. So, you know, it, it all makes visceral sense, like having this client-centered concept, building this experience, making the law firm more adaptable um, and more able to move into the future makes a lot of visceral sense. Do you have, in, in, in preparing for the book or in your thinking around this, have you seen evidence in other industries or other professions that this is really the way to go? Well, re- really at the, the heart of you know, my thinking on this, this concept of the, the client-centric uh, law firm uh, was, was some of the shifts I saw in other industries that, that I think are, are great leading indicators for us of, of how consumer expectations are are shifting, and one of the concepts I talk about in the book, and one of the concepts I, I talked about in my my last CleoCon keynote, is this idea of the consumerization of of legal services. And I think when we look at examples like uh, like Netflix, uh, like Uber, mm-hmm. like Airbnb, consumers are getting used to all of their experiences becoming 
more simplified and more streamlined and more effortless. And effortless is a word that I use uh, really deliberately because I think it encapsulates uh, a lot of concepts in a, in a really concise way. And, and the idea is that consumers, especially millennials, who are rapidly becoming the largest purchasing generation on the, on the planet, their expectations of what interacting with every service provider that they work with uh, is, is shifting radically. Yeah. All the way from cable cutting uh, to adopting services like, uh, like Netflix. Obviously, we're seeing the shift away from, from, from taxis to uh, car uh, sharing services like Uber and Lyft. Vacation rentals, which used to be you know, a lot of filling out forms and faxing paperwork, are now a couple of taps away with, yep. with services like Airbnb. So this, this consumerization of legal services is all of those consumer expectations around effortless experiences uh, coming to bear in the legal services market. And guess what? When, you're, when your website, if you have a website, when your website says as its main call to action, call me at 1-800-whatever, yeah. know that for the millennial generation, you are basically putting up a huge stop sign on your website. The idea of using their phone as a phone is <laughs> anathema to this generation, right? Yeah. Uh, they want what they expect from a lawyer that gets them and knows how to work with them is a chat bot that is going to be able to do intake with them and Hopefully that leads to probably a video call on their smartphone. You know, we believe that the future of legal service delivery will be over the cloud. We believe that more and more consumers are going to want to have their uh, their legal interactions uh, mediated through uh, their their smartphone rather than you know in in some expensive AAA do- downtown office space in their right. uh, in their in their lawyer's office. Uh, we believe clients in the future are going to want to text message their lawyer more than they're going to want to, you know, again, visit them in, in person in their, in their law office. So, and this is not a, a huge leap of faith in my mind. You know, the kinds of uh, positions that, uh, you know, that I take in this book and that I take in my general thinking about how legal services are going to evolve, I think might seem revolutionary to some that are, are maybe just inward focused right now on, on the current state of the legal industry. But if you even spend any time at all looking outward in other industries and the kind of transformations they've they've gone through over the last decade and what separates the winners from losers in those industries in terms of who's adapted to these changes and who hasn't, to me, the the writing is very clearly on the wall hmm. uh, for, for the legal industry. And uh, to your earlier point around the, the messaging in the book, it's it is a, a rallying cry to the industry as a whole, saying there's still time for the lawyers that dial into this sea change that's underway and adapt to the legal marketplace that is shifting under their feet. There is not just room to survive, but room to thrive. Uh, but for the rest of that think that they can continue practicing in this new decade uh, the way that they were in the 2010s, they're going to be in for a, a rude awakening. And I, I do think that there's... Yeah, they, they, they need to go check out Blockbuster, right? Yeah, exactly. There's instructive examples and carcasses of uh, companies uh, and individuals that have not been able to figure this uh, this transition out in many other industries. And uh, I, I think that it's, it's an enormous opportunity for firms that want to em- embrace change and get ahead of the curve, but it's it's also an existential risk for the companies that don't adapt. Indeed. All right, we are talking with Jack Newton. He's the CEO of Clio, and we've been discussing the uh, wisdom and the proof and the evidence that uh, really focusing on becoming a more client-centered law firm is the path, uh, or it's actually the fork in the road. Uh, that decision to become one or not is uh, is the decision to be able to move your firm into the uh, into the future or to become a relic. Uh, when we come back from this break, uh, Jack, I'm going to ask you to, you, you mentioned earlier five core values of a client center law firm. I'd like to detail those um, and kind of review what each one is quickly for the listeners. Um, but before that, let's hear a quick word from our sponsors. Feel like your marketing efforts aren't getting you the high value cases your firm deserves? 
For over 15 years, Scorpion has helped thousands of law firms just like yours attract new cases and grow their practices. As a Google Premier Partner and winner of Google's Platform Innovator Award, Scorpion has the right resources and technology to aggressively market your law firm and generate better cases from the internet. For more information, visit scorpionlegal.com forward slash podcast today. Ready to create and build your own solo or small farm practice? Need a nuts and bolts education on the 360 degree experience of starting a business? There's only one online destination dedicated to helping you achieve your goals, Solo Practice University. The only online educational and professional networking community dedicated to lawyers and law students who want to go into practice for themselves. More than a thousand classes, 58 faculty and mentors. What are you waiting for? Check out solopracticeuniversity.com today. And welcome back to the Unbillable Hour. We're talking with Jack Newton, and we are now going to move on a little bit from from the sort of big picture of what it means to be a client-centered law firm and why that's really important to discussing five core values that a client-centered law firm should have. Um, I guess this can serve both as a um, analysis of where one is um, as a, with their law firm and where one needs to be. So, Jack, would you mind talking about what those five core values are? Absolutely. So, the the five core values of a, a client centric law firm are number one, developing deep client empathy. Uh, that that really is centered on the idea that you need to truly put yourself in the shoes of your client and try to understand you know, their emotional context, understand the other challenges they might be dealing with, and understand with the benefit of, of your experience and seeing the kinds of challenges that your your client will be facing in, uh, in other similar scenarios, how you can help them navigate the challenges that are ahead of them. And I, I think this concept of empathy is is probably one of the most powerful and and underutilized uh, skill sets that a lawyer uh, can deploy in redesigning their firm to be more client centric. The second core value is before we move on to the second one. I mean, that to me that like that comes from what we were talking about earlier: the difference between being transactional and having a more holistic approach to to your client's life and business. That I think the empathy both probably drives that and comes from that in a, in a very virtuous cycle. Yeah, and I I think it runs counter to you know maybe many lawyers concepts of what this idealized notion of a lawyer should be, which which I think is is often something that is is framed as you're somewhat cold and removed from from the client and there's this almost removed approach to engaging with your uh, your client. And this isn't necessarily about being more emotional and it, it's crucial not to confuse empathy with sympathy you know th- this is is really when we're talking about design and and a, a, something we haven't had time to really go in depth on is this idea of design thinking and doing a a journey map of what your client is going mm-hmm. through but just to outline that concept very very briefly which I do go in in more depth in the book this concept of of customer journey mapping or client journey mapping is really trying to unpack what are the series of events that has brought this client to your door? What is the broader context that they're dealing with that you should be aware of to help better to deliver the legal services they need today? And then importantly, what are the next steps on this journey and, and this the steps that lead to the client succeeding or winning or achieving their goal that you can help them down that path? And how can you anticipate those needs going forward? And it is really this concept of empathy of, you know, the the Greek origin of the word is around the concept of being able to place yeah. yourself in someone else's mind, of being able to see through yes. their, their eyes. It's truly going through that exercise and trying to put yourself in your client's shoes and understand the challenges they're facing and how you can best help them navigate what lies ahead. And if there's one concept that readers come away with a, the book, you know, with a better appreciation of that I'd be, you know, happy with as, as as a win, it's that concept of empathy and that being a really powerful tool for lawyers to de- deploy that I think is one of the least exercised aspects of a lawyer's toolkit in in most law offices today. 
Sure. And, and with that thought now around developing deep client empathy, which is the first of the five values, I think that probably dovetails really well with the second one. Um, could you explain that one? The second core value is is practicing attentiveness. And we use the word attentiveness rather than responsiveness because it's not necessarily you know, always being responsive and again, again, kind of reactive to your clients, but being attentive to what point they are on this client journey, understanding uh, when and where you should be interjecting yourself into their experience and, and offering your, uh, your assistance. It's about being present, you know, of course, when, when your, your client is, is speaking to you and, and talking to you. This concept of, of attentiveness, I think, is, is a, a really important value of a client-centered law firm. Yeah. And, and of course, being attentive to where they are on the journey helps you with that empathy. And the empathy, I think, helps with that attentiveness and, and to developing and designing, as you were saying, across the board. Once you become familiar with one and then 10 and then 100 clients' journeys, what they're going to be experiencing at what points and designing the experience to meet them where they are. Um, so the third uh, core value that you talked about in the book is called generating ease with communication. What's meant by that? This is really about trying to think carefully about how you're communicating with your your clients and optimizing your communication channels and communication style to what the client's expectations might be. So, you know, again, for, you know, one of the really interesting findings we had from the legal trends report, uh, both this year and, and, and last year, uh, which uh, I know you're familiar with, Christopher, but if your audience isn't, uh, Google legal trends report, it's a free publication available that uh, Clio publishes on an annual basis. And one of the things we found over the last two years of our legal trends report is this huge chasm between how lawyers think that their clients want to communicate with them and how their clients actually <laughs> yeah. want to communicate with them. So to give you a few concrete examples, uh, in, in going through a legal document uh, with a client and going through the details, for example, of their, of their case, lawyers tend to think that a phone call might be an acceptable way to go through that part of a, a case with a client. Uh, and many clients tell us in this survey that they want that to be an in-person interaction. They want to sit down and really work through you know, the document or work through the details of their, their case in person with their lawyer. So some of this generating ease with communication could be as simple as asking clients, how do you want to communicate with me? Yeah. Uh, you might have some clients tell you that they want to be able to text message you, uh, which I think is is something we see increasingly with uh, with with clients and their uh, their lawyers. Again, depending on your the demographic of clients you're, you're dealing with, they might prefer a phone call. So just understanding right. How can you communicate more effectively with your clients? And also something, this is, this is one of the places technology can play a huge hand, is how can you communicate passively with your clients without it necessarily needing to be something active, like a phone call or an in-person meeting, where uh, you might have a communications portal. Uh, there's tools like case status, for example, that will automatically notify your clients when certain key events happen on their case. Uh, something I, th I think that's important to note is many clients, and, and one of the common complaints that law societies and bar associations receive relating to lawyers is that they feel their lawyers haven't been communicating with them enough over the course of the case. And in some cases, what what's, I think run, runs counter to many lawyers' default sense of, of logic on this is sometimes clients want an update even just to know that there's no update. You know, there's been no development in their case. They haven't heard back from the court, whatever the case might be. Um, so being proactive about that and setting automatic reminders or uh, having automated systems or have client portals where your clients can log in and check on the status of their case whenever they want to. You know, there's a lot of different ways to improve communications right. with clients without increasing the amount of time you're spending doing it or without hiring staff to do it. Yeah, I mean, we have a generation that's used to, you know, when you want to know your bank balance, when you want to know if your flight's on time, when you want to know your lab results from your latest medical, you get that information when you want it. Exactly. On demand. Exactly. And that is part of the, you know, the seismic shift in consumer expectations that uh, law firms that anticipate that and, and uh, you know, skate to where the puck's going in terms of <laughs> being able to deliver legal services uh, in, in that kind of a way are going to be the ones that win over the next decade. 
leave it to the Canadian to introduce the hockey reference. Very good. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that, th- those were the first three. Develop client empathy, one. Two, practice attentiveness. Three, generate ease with communication. And then the fourth one kind of sounds like it has something to do with the communication, but it's also probably, it goes a bit deeper. Yeah, so the, the fourth is demand effortless experiences. And this this concept of effortless experiences really ties back to that that concept of the, the consumerization of legal services that I was referring to earlier. And just look at every touch point that you have with both a prospective client as well as an existing client and think about how can I make their experience as effortless as possible. So again, if we're taking this this view of uh, client intake, for example, are you making the client pick up their phone and phone your law firm and leave a voicemail or leave a message hoping that somebody will call call them back in the intake process? Or are you designing a, an intake process that is electronic, that maybe has a you know chat bot asking a few questions, and then scheduling an initial consultation with the client through through your website or through your your mobile website that that allows the client in a completely effortless way to tee up that initial consultation with your with your firm and to use another example if you're sending documents and, and none, not all of this stuff needs to be boil the ocean huge initiatives that that involve a lot of incredible innovation some of this stuff can be as simple as Deploying a tool like e-signatures for your clients, for example, where yep. uh, if you're asking uh, a client to sign a document, let's say you're a business lawyer and you're doing a big financing transaction for a client, you need to get 15 signatures on a, on a document. Can you do that with an e-signature tool? Or are you, are you going to be asking all of these uh, signatories to put a wet signature on something and, and, and fax it to you? And again, the clients that appreciate effortless experiences are going to see the the lawyer that sends them the the e-signature document and just feel like they they get it they're doing something small yeah. to make my life easier uh, I can get this document signed on my on my mobile phone I don't even need to to get up from the couch to get this done this is you know this is the future and you want your clients feeling like you get it and that you are living in the in the future and deploying the technologies of today to make their their life cycle with your law firm uh, as as smooth and as effortless as possible and and this is the place that I think you know as a technology provider as well on the Clio side this is where I'm so excited for the next decade because I think so much of the talk around the impact that technology can have on law firms for the last 20 or 30 years has been rooted in this concept of it being a productivity enhancer and an efficiency enhancer. And I think while all of that is fine, that's ironically enough kind of rooted in this law firm centric model of the past that right, I think exactly. I think we advocate moving beyond in this book. It's technology, you know, hey, it's great if it can help you automate that document or shave five minutes off of your day, or do whatever, you know, whatever helps you, you know, get 10% more productive over the course of a year. That's great. But what is truly exciting, I think, about the technological era we're we're entering is that it's going to be something that transforms client experiences and allows law firms that truly embrace technology to deliver client experiences that are simply impossible to deliver without those those technologies and for them to realize a huge competitive advantage for themselves through their use of technology and through their ability to deliver effortless experiences to their clients. Uh, and I, I think the the smartest law firms in the world right now understand that that's, that's the true potential for technology. And it's, it's something I'm obviously uh, passionate and, and excited about as well. Yeah. Um, and, and like you said, it's focusing on the law firm will make you more efficient, but it doesn't make much sense to be more efficient if there's no clients to be efficient for. So that, I think that leads us well into, I think, the holistic final core value, the fifth core value, uh, which is which you've stated is create clients for life. How does How does doing all of this that we've been talking about really help to create clients for life? 
Right. So what is at the heart of this concept of creating clients for life is this idea of the the flywheel. And for some of your listeners that, that may not be familiar with this, this concept of a flywheel, it's uh, at least in a business context, uh, a concept that Jim Collins popularized with his, uh, his book, Good to Great. Yeah. And what he talked about being a commonality across many of the best performing companies that he analyzed uh, in this book is this idea that they they all have a flywheel that is helping drive their businesses. And a great example of a, a flywheel of business success uh, that I like to reference is, is Amazon's flywheel, where you know sure. they, they realize that as they become the biggest marketplace in the world, they're able to deliver more selection to their consumers. That in turn draws more consumers to their marketplace. That in turn allows them to drive the lowest price thanks to their uh, purchasing scale uh, and so on and so forth, where that virtuous cycle of more consumers driving more selection and more scale and better pricing and better client experience helps Amazon. And and they've been turning that flywheel for 20 years now to the point that they are this unstoppable juggernaut in e-commerce that, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, it's hard to imagine who could ever displace uh, Amazon because they have this this flywheel that was extremely hard to turn back in, in 1999 yeah. when, when Jeff Bezos started it with, you know, first books and then, you know, two or three other items. And over the course of 20 years, he has been turning that flywheel really systematically and, and built this this unstoppable machine. And I, I think for law firms, there's a very analogous concept of a flywheel that they can turn for their, their law firms. And again, the idea of a, lot of a flywheel effect is getting that initial rotational energy in the flywheel going takes a lot of effort. But after you've got some momentum going in there, and once you've got the inputs to that flywheel going, it just turns itself almost. And right. it's got this energy store and this momentum that you invest a lot in getting going. But then once it's going, you can kind of turn your attention elsewhere and count on the flywheel to keep moving. And for law firms, when we look at what drives a law firm's growth, and again, this is all data that that is derived from and inspired by the, the legal trends report work that we do, we know that the number one thing that drives law firm growth is referrals. And we know that referrals come from satisfied customers. Yes. And we know that the other major source of business for, for law firms is positive reviews on online marketplaces like, like Google reviews or Avo reviews. Uh, we know that you know word of mouth plays a huge role in bringing new clients to law firms. So when you look at your, your law firm's flywheel and you think about what the inputs are that are helping drive growth for your law firm, at the heart of that is a satisfied client that came away from your law firm with you know, a positive experience. And to put a fine point on that, one of the concepts we talk about in the, uh, in the book is the concept of net promoter score or NPS. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you know, I, I'm always amazed when I, when I ask an, an audience, when I'm, I'm giving a talk about this, uh, some of the concepts of the, the client-centric law firm when I ask the audience how many people have heard of NPS before, it's it's only one or two hands that go up in most in most talks. And I think this is one of the most important business metrics for any business to to understand. And it, it's a really simple concept, which is it's in some cases called you know the the most important question that you can ask right. in a survey. And the question is this: you know, based on your experience with my law firm. How likely would you be to recommend me to uh, a friend or colleague? And the scale of responses is from one to ten, and based on that response, you come out with either you know detractors who are in the uh, the zero to seven range, neutrals right. who are uh, seven or eight, and promoters who are nine or tens. And what you want is as many of the people that you've delivered legal services to, to be, you know, on the promoter end of that scale. And if they are on the promoter end of the scale, they're the ones that will be driving that flywheel of success for your, for your law firm. So one of the recommendations we, we, we make in the book is 
ask your clients when you've delivered your work product to them and kind of tied off your, uh, at least your present engagement with them, send them an NPS survey asking exactly that question. And uh, I've, I've been you know, surprised and a bit taken aback at how almost shocked uh, some, some lawyers that I talked to about this concept are about the idea that they would, they would ask a client whether they were, they were satisfied with their, their services. You know, sometimes that comes from a place of you know, arrogance. Sometimes that comes from a place of insecurity. Sometimes that comes from you know, just a, a place of, of confusion where they'll say, I've, I've never thought about asking my client you know, how they, they viewed their experience with me and whether they would be a, be a promoter or not. But I, I do think this is a really, really powerful and simple mechanism for law firms to, number one, gauge where they are on that scale, as uncomfortable as that learning might be, and then listening to the feedback you get. Because you know, the, the second right. question in that NPS survey is, you know, why did you give me that score? And it's a free form text field that, you know, some will be blank, but many of your respondents will give you an answer as to why they're giving you that that rating. And that is actionable feedback to put into what we describe sure. as a, a closed loop process in the in the book where you can iterate on and improve on the way you're delivering legal services based on that on that feedback. Good or bad, right? The promoters and the detractors. That's right. Understand what you should be doubling down on. Uh, sometimes you'll be surprised at the things that that delighted your clients or helped really separate you from the pack in uh, in the experience you delivered to them. And then in some cases, uh, you'll hear really hard feedback. And and again, you know, the approach in designing a client-centric law firm has got to be one where you are constantly gathering that uh, that feedback. And, and some of the law firms I've worked with have been able to move their NPS scores from negative territory where, you know, they've got overall a, a, a negative overall sentiment to their, to their law firm and more, more detractors than promoters to a situation where their, their NPS score is in the seventies and eighties, which is, which is wow. rare air. That's, that's, that's Amazon and Apple, yes. Apple like NPS ratings. And, you know, back, back to the core value of cl- creating clients for life, the idea here is think about every client as, you know, number one, importantly being in most areas of law, this is somebody that can become uh, a repeat client, right? This is somebody that can come back to you for more work in the future. So are you, are you designing your interaction with that client to service their their full life cycle of needs, map out what that client's needs will be over the next 20, 30 years of their life and how you can service those. Because I I think what many lawyers fail to realize is that their clients don't know what they don't know. And they need a partner to help them understand what's coming down the pike and how you put your finger on it exactly at the beginning of the podcast, Christopher, with your comment around being a counselor. You're a counselor to your clients. And they want you to play that role, but they don't know how to invite you to play that role. You actually need to play a proactive role in turning them into clients for life. And a side effect of making clients for life will be that those clients will be having all sorts of positive second order effects on your law firm through this flywheel, through this flywheel effect where they are right. talking about how amazing and proactive they're their lawyer is about how they help them anticipate a challenge and how, how they help them navigate that challenge. They'll leave positive Google reviews for your law firm. They'll leave AVO reviews for your law firm. You name it. You, you'll have all sorts of positive second order effects that in some total are probably more valuable than whatever you might generate from that one client. So I think thinking about every client as, as being you know, somebody that cannot just be satisfied on their own, but create this halo effect around their interaction that helps bring your next client to your doors. Uh, and, and not only that, but by the way, if you've done a good job of uh, of picking your first clients, they will bring more clients like themselves to your door. And you'll get not just exactly. the right number of clients, but the right types of clients. Yeah. And that dovetails, Jack, to, to me, and I want to get this in before we reach uh, the end of the show, the really eye-opening and kind of the most optimistic to me concept in the book, 
was the thinking and and uh, analysis of what you call the latent legal market. Because this isn't just about keeping uh, your the market share that lawyers have or about growing their market share at the cost of other law firms or other non-law firm services. But you wrote about the latent legal market right. and that growing the pie is what this is really all about. Yeah, that's just it. You know, and I, I think, you know, there's this this amazing disconnect to me in the marketplace that as an entrepreneur, you know, to me it, it sets off my my spidey signal that hey, there's a huge opportunity here. I think in the same way that I felt about the the cloud-based legal practice management market in, in 2008. I look at the the legal landscape today and see the World Justice Project publishing figures telling us that 77% of legal problems didn't receive legal assistance. So Astounding. Astounding, right? There, there's a huge amount of, if you want to talk about supply and demand, there's a huge amount, amount of demand for legal services that is being unmet by lawyers and legal professionals. Now, on the flip side, you, you look at that kind of asymmetry in a marketplace and you, you say, well, that must be because you know all the lawyers are busy. The the twenty three percent of the market that is being addressed uh, or is having their problems addressed must be taking up all the resources of of, of the legal marketplace. And of course, we know that's not true because eighty percent. Right. No. You know, again, in the legal yeah. trends reports, many, well, as well as many other reports, we know that eighty plus percent of lawyers want to need more clients. We know that many, many lawyers are, you know, in a very tough financial situation. We know that they're not making a, a living wage. We know that most lawyers couldn't afford their own uh, hourly rate for legal services. So you look at that, that disconnect where, you know, on the demand side, you have 77% of legal needs going unaddressed by lawyers. On the supply side, you have 80% of lawyers saying they want more clients. And you just think about how do how do you reconcile that gap? And you know, I, I talk about that that seventy seven percent of the legal market that is seeing their legal needs go unaddressed by lawyers as the latent legal market. You know, that is a an untapped legal market that is available for lawyers that can think about how do I innovate on the way I'm delivering legal services, and that could be the medium through which I'm delivering legal services, that could be innovating on my pricing model, that could be innovating by doing something as simple as accepting credit cards rather than checks, this could be innovating by uh, selling your, your legal services as a subscription rather than an upfront fee. But this is really at the heart of what I think the, the access to justice gap is about, and bridging the access to justice gap is, is not some you know, heady thing that we need bar associations or some foundation to solve right. for us. This is something where we need innovative lawyers to roll up their sleeves and say, I, I see this, you know, as a, as both an opportunity to create justice for those that deserve it, as well as to address a market need. And I'm going to figure out how to tap into that, uh, that latent legal market. And that, that market is enormous, by the way, the 23% of legal needs that are being addressed today is a $437 billion annual market. So the back of the napkin math is that this 77% of unaddressed needs is you know, on the order of a $1.4 trillion market opportunity. And again, the structural costs in that 77% of the market may be significantly less than the 23% that is being addressed right. today. So that may not correspond to exactly $1.4 trillion market opportunity, but it is without question a multi-hundred billion dollar market opportunity for the entrepreneurial lawyers that want to go after that. And I think we often talk about, you know, as, as you pointed out, the legal services marketplace as being this commodified, hyper-competitive market where people have a hard time eking out a, a living. But I, I think that is for lawyers that are delivering legal services the way that they were delivered 30 years ago. Yes, the oxygen in the room for those lawyers is running out and they are competing against each other using the same tired business model that they, they were 30 years ago. For the lawyers that want to separate from that pack and look at this unbelievable latent legal market as a business opportunity, there's no competition. You, this is a greenfield opportunity and the ability for you to create a meaningful market opportunity for yourself and to be an entrepreneur taking advantage of that market opportunity 
and you know as a as a great side effect also increasing access to justice i think that is uh you know that's that's a, a win-win that we just need more entrepreneurial lawyers thinking innovatively about uh about how they can tap into that market opportunity and to me that is what will ultimately help bridge the the access to justice gap yeah and i think that's exactly the right uh perspective in 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 the solution to access to justice is actually making justice available in the way that the consumers want want to consume it and I think that's a hugely optimistic message, Jack. So as, as we wrap up the show today, I just want to, uh, you know, I think the book and your message and what you've been talking about today here really does paint a very optimistic picture for those willing to take the journey. But the book, it's, you know, there's a lot of scary stuff in there about what, about the stuff that's not going to work anymore. How do you want your readers to come to the book and, and, and what do you want them to hope to get out of it? Uh, if we want to leave the, leave the listener with that thought. Well, I, I think you're right. At the heart of it, the book is optimistic, and my hope is that the the readers of the book will will leave their experience of of reading the book energized and equipped for driving the kind of change that will see them not just survive but thrive in the uh, in the coming decade. And I've tried to strike a really pragmatic balance of laying out the the case for urgency, laying out why this matters and why this is the moment that lawyers need to, you know, pick up their heads from the from the ground and pay attention to the tectonic changes that are underway in the marketplace around them, to understand the opportunity for for those of them that lean into those changes and and innovate on the way they're delivering legal services. And then, you know, to not just have a a rallying cry, but a, a set of pragmatic and practical tools that the average lawyer can deploy uh, in their in their law practice in a really iterative way to help evolve their law firm toward becoming a client centric law firm. And and so my my hope is that readers will come into the book curious and will will leave the book feeling very well equipped and inspired and energized to put the the lessons of the book to work. Well, I got to tell you, that's definitely inspired, I think is the right word um, for how I came out of the book. So I think I think you got a good chance of, of achieving that. Um, thank you very much, Jack. Yeah, thanks for having me, Christopher. Really enjoyed this. You bet. That wraps up this edition of the Unbillable Hour, the Law Business Advisory Podcast. Um, my guest today has been Jack Newton, the CEO and co-founder of Clio. And you can learn more, or if uh, if you want to learn more about this topic or anything else about Clio or about Jack, uh, you can find out more and or contact him at Clio.com or on his Twitter account, which is at Jack underscore Newton. Do I have that right, Jack? You've got it. All right. And the Facebook uh, is Clio, uh, Cloud-Based Legal Technology, and LinkedIn, Jack Newton. And again, this is Christopher Anderson, and I look forward to seeing you all next month with another great guest as we learn more about topics that help us build the law firm business that works for you. Remember, you can subscribe to all the editions of this podcast at LegalTalkNetwork.com or on iTunes. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again soon. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by Legal Talk Network. Its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer. Thanks for listening to the Unbillable Hour, the Law Practice Advisory Podcast. Join us again for the next edition, right here with Legal Talk Network.